Thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in the day of battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke and we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all other evil spirits who wander throughout the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Mary, help of Christians. Saint Joseph, terror of demons. Holy guardian angels. Saint Chabelle. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Firstly, it's a pleasure to be here. And I wanted to start off this talk with the prayer to St. Michael the Archangel for a specific reason. It is a prayer that reminds us of what? We are engaged in a battle, a spiritual battle. St. Paul even reminds us of this, that our combat is not with flesh and blood, but actually with principalities or the spirit of darkness. So whenever we are praying that prayer to St. Michael the Archangel, it is the idea that we are in a combat. We are in engaged in a horrible battle, a victorious battle, God willing, nonetheless a battle. And perhaps there's no more clear time in our lives, and particularly in our spiritual life, when we realize when we're in a battle than when we fall into temptation. Or when temptation comes our way and threatens to cross the threshold of our soul to become sin. There's a difference between temptation and sin. Temptation is the inclination to a certain evil. Sin is the succumbing to that temptation. Lead us not into temptation, we say in the Lord's Prayer, but nonetheless, when that temptation is presented, there's one of two ways in reacting to it. One, to resist, and by so doing, become the victor. Or two, to fall into that temptation, no matter what that temptation may be. As we start off the season of Lent, or now well into the first week of Lent, it is a good topic to consider temptation, our fall, or how we can fall, whether it be a small fall or a great fall, a grievous fall. The idea is that when temptation comes our way, being a soldier, we can react to it in a very positive way. So why talk about temptation? Well. We're meant to imitate Christ, are we not? That's why we call ourselves Christian. But imagine Christ himself, he was also tempted. That was the gospel to start off the season of Lent. So just reminding you of that from the fourth chapter of St. Matthew. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not tempt the Lord your God. Again the devil took him up to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. And he said to him, All these things I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it, is writ- for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and ministered unto him. The temptation of Christ. A threefold temptation. Ponder this well, because believe it or not, there are people who say the devil doesn't exist. That evil really doesn't exist, only from our own hearts. The devil really doesn't exist. That's the devil's first tool, to have us believe he doesn't exist. Because if we believe he does not exist, there's no battle. And if the devil does not exist, there's no redemption. We can become complacent, become lazy in our spiritual lives. 
So when I hear people say, oh, well, in the past, the church taught the existence of hell, but hell isn't taught anymore. It's really not there. When I hear such comments, I want to pull my hair out, all three of them. <laughs> Please don't laugh. I cry. <laughs> but St. John, likewise, in his first letter, he says the following. And this is great because these words concern people of all ages. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young people, because you have conquered the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young people, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. So immediately, St. John is reminding us, once again, a battle, a spiritual battle, to overcome the evil one. So how do we do this? St. John will apply some beautiful words of wisdom here. Do not love the world or the things in the world. The love of the Father is not in those who love the world. For all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the pride in riches, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desire are passing away, but those who do the will of God live forever. So now, think well, we're going to tie in something here. That threefold temptation of Christ involves these three things. One, a love of the world. Two, the desire of the eyes. And thirdly, the desire of the flesh. Or well, St. John might also use another term, concupiscence. The concupiscence of the eyes, the concupiscence of the flesh, and the pride of life. So how was our Lord tempted, of which we read in the Scriptures? Well, when our Lord heard the words of Satan, turn these stones into bread, that was the idea of a self-indulgence. So hence, the desires of the flesh or the concupiscence of the flesh. Turn these stones into bread. When our Lord heard the words of Satan directed to him, leap off from the pinnacle of the temple and your angel will hold you up and you will not dash your foot against the stone, that was another temptation, the pride of life. So our Lord having to depend entirely on the devil himself, impossible, but nonetheless a temptation. Then likewise, when the devil presented to our Lord all the kingdoms of the world, he said to Jesus, all these things will I give you if bowing down you worship me. The concupiscence of the eyes, the desire of the eyes. Now when I talk about concupiscence, I mean an unhealthy desire, a disordered desire. There's nothing wrong with gazing upon things that are beautiful. I look in the bathroom mirror and say, oh, well, oh, never mind. <laughs> so, so, and again you laugh, thanks. But, uh, so we see here that threefold temptation, and let's face it, those threefold temptations come our way as well. The concupiscence of the flesh, the concupiscence of the eyes, and the pride of life. That is basically summing it all up how we must encounter the spiritual life by way of a battle. And when it comes to these different tactics that the devil will throw at us, we have counter tactics. We can counter the attacks of the devil because again, temptation is not sin. It is something presented to us. And when we remind ourselves of the fact that the devil is the prince of lies, then we know that whatever he says to us is an absolute lie. He's not going to say to us, oh, this is pure evil, you must take this. No, he's going to present it by way of advertising. He's going to make it look good. And hence, that's exactly what he does. And he will use the things of this world or the elements of this world to put a sugar coating on top of sin, to try to make us to grasp and embrace that temptation to fall into it. So the attack of the most dominant passion first. Think of this. In other words, what is my predominant fault? If I am engaged in a spiritual battle, 
I must ask myself, where am I putting most of the energies of that battle? My predominant fault, the word predominant, something that tries to overtake me, to dominate me, to use some sort of order of dominance that the devil, the world, and the flesh will try to put over us, the domain of the prince of lies. We could even use it that way. So the order to be observed in the conflict when it comes to being greeted by temptation is first things first. I must see what is my predominant fault, and I must attack that one. But if the devil decides to throw more temptations, I must look at that one immediately and try to overcome that one as well. Because when did the devil attack our Lord? He waited till he was the weakest. Jesus had fasted 40 days, 40 nights. I can't fast 40 minutes. So we think of the idea that when we fast, we become weak physically, yet we become strong spiritually. It's a great mystery when we consider the concept of fasting, because if we abstain from things that are legitimate, it will strengthen the will so that we can abstain from things that are illegitimate. Fasting from food reminds us to fast from sin, especially anything dealing with a disordered desires of the things of the flesh to abstain from sin. So when we pursue the things that are legitimate, we can be strong against the things that are illegitimate. So hence, when we fast, it is the idea, yes, I might feel weak, I might feel dizzy in terms of the body, but in terms of the soul, it is gaining strength to strength because I am doing this fasting so I can fast from sin. So it may weaken the body, but it strengthens the will and is great for the soul. I understand that you have a wonderful uh, discipline when it comes to fasting, in terms of fasting from midnight to noon. That's a good way of looking at it, and then from there, whatever you would need. Fasting involves prudence, that we do not want to weaken ourselves to the point that we go against our daily duties of our state of life. And also, when it comes to fasting, we can easily become cranky, short-tempered, impatient, in other words, always being Lebanese. But um, so, okay, moving right along. Okay, so the idea is that when we do some sort of fasting, it is for a higher level. That we're actually concentrating on something that we can do to strengthen our will and love God more. In fact, the Catechism enumerates what's called the three great works of merit. Fasting, almsgiving, and praying. Those are known as the three works of merit, and certainly something to practice during the season of Lent. So we see what is my predominant fault. And when we see what that fault is, the last thing we're going to say to the devil is, okay, Satan, let's make a deal. No, we do not do that. There are no T's and C's, no terms and conditions when it comes to making a pact with the devil. If we do that, what happens? We easily compromise. So we do not make a truce with the devil because, again, he is the prince of lies. So as soon as we awake, we should be vigilant. Use the eyes of our mind. So when you use the eyes of your mind, you wake up in the morning, you say to yourself, okay, I'm starting off the day. We read in the book of Job that life on earth is a warfare. I get up, I roll out of bed, I say a morning offering. I say the morning Angelus. I say some sort of prayer so that immediately I can levitate my mind to the things of God. That's prayer. To elevate the mind to the things of God. So when we do that, we're defining our battlefield. We see our position. And in fact, in the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, he presents to us a battlefield. And it's wonderful. Because in the midst of that meditation, he'll say that on one side, to the right are the followers of Christ, the martyrs, the virgins, the confessors, all those who led holy lives. And then on the other side, and he says in that particular battlefield, those are the followers of Christ, they're surrounded by a bright light. And you have Christ on a, on a throne. But on that throne, he gets down from the throne and he mingles among his people and they flock to him. And then on the other side of the battlefield, St. Ignatius says, says is a devil and all his agents, all those that do his work. Can we come up in our own minds how the devil does his work? 
Think of the word pornography. It's a Greek word. It means pictures of evil or pictures of the devil. Pornography is something as old as the hills. It's certainly modernized in terms of social media and all that. It's been around a long time. Too long. Even a day is too long. But imagine that being used as a means on the part of the devil. Something that can easily weaken the conscience, weaken the intellect, weaken our will. What other means will the devil use in the midst of his battlefield that he may try to throw at us? Bad conversation, bad companions, anything like that. Anything that may try to thwart what we are trying to do to be strong. Now, St. Augustine, he says, when it comes to dealing with any passion, like anger and impatience, he says, front it. Go right up to it. Confront it. But he says, when it comes to any temptations against the flesh, he says, the true soldier runs in the opposite direction. Why? He's making a retreat. And a retreat is a battle strategy. Soldiers, when they realize that they're engaged in battle, wait, this enemy is too strong, or they're using different tactics that I'm not familiar with, we must retreat, regroup, get strong again, and go back to the fight. That's what we do when it comes to temptation, to resist. The idea of that spiritual battle of which we're all engaged. So we then find ourselves, as soon as we're out of bed, saying our morning prayer, morning offering, there is a battlefield in front of me. Then I get dressed. I go out into the world to my place of work or my place of education, wherever I have to go for the day. What will I confront? Am I strong enough to confront whatever I will be confronting? Am I strong enough to resist temptation? Will I be with a group of my mates who are known not for good conversation or disrespecting others, especially those of the opposite gender? Are those my mates? Are those my friends? Are those the ones I want to associate with? So you say to yourself, wait a minute, if I'm in a battle, I need those who are thinking like I am. I need soldiers with a common bond. I don't need weak soldiers. I need strong soldiers. I need those with whom I can regroup and make sure that I am strong with them. And hence, especially the praiseworthy idea of gathering like this, the guardians, guardians of the soul, guardians of the mind. The healthiest peer pressure we could ever have is when our mate says to us in private, oh, mate, don't talk like that. That's not really our scene. Or mate, you know, can I help you through something? You seem angry today. Or mate, I accidentally saw a picture on your phone that really shouldn't be there. Uh, can we talk about that? Something like that, just examples whereby we fortify or edify, we build up. We do not tear down. We do not weaken. So we see here a spiritual battle with one plan in mind, I must save my soul. That's the one plan I have, I must save my soul. So you represent yourself to your enemy. Your enemy is on the left because that happens at the end of the world in judgment. But those who decide not to follow Christ, when Christ comes in judgment, depart from me, you are cursed, he will say to those on the left. Depart from me, you are cursed. And all those on the right, he will say, welcome into the kingdom that was prepared for you since the foundation of the world. So what is our mantra? What is our battle cry? What do we say? Perhaps I can come from the easiest question in a catechism, why did God make me? God made me to know him, love him, and serve him in this world, so I will be happy with him in the next. And if we look at that in terms of our battle plan, we will focus using that mantra in mind, I will save my soul. So to your right are those who are victorious, those who follow our Lord. His Holy Mother will be there. What a great refuge of sinners that she is. You know, when we consider the Blessed Virgin Mary, look what happened early on when she, when she and her husband Joseph were looking for the Christ child. You know, they made the visit to the temple. Jesus was 12 years old. And so at the end of that day's journey, they realized Christ was not in their midst. And the commentators say, that Our Lady obtained that title, Refuge of Sinners, because she knew firsthand the grief and the anxiety that she felt 
when she was separated from Christ. That is why she is known as the refuge of sinners. She was separated from Christ, not spiritually, perfect human being, the only perfect human being, born without original sin or the effects of original sin, the only perfect human being. And of course, she had to be a lady, okay? I hope that scores. Okay, so the only perfect human being, and so she knew firsthand the grieving that she would experience losing the presence of Christ. St. Joseph as well. They have lost the Son of God. So when Our Lady had that title given to her, the refuge of sinners, she knew firsthand what it was like to lose Christ. Sin does the same for us. Mortal sin. Deadly sin. And again, we live in a world that is totally indifferent to the malice of sin. We have lost the sense of sin. And now finding ourselves in the season of Lent, we can build ourselves up. I know what sin is because I'm fasting or I'm doing penance. I am mortifying myself. Mortification from the Latin meaning to put to death something. To put by way of action something to death. Mortis facere. Mortification. To kill off something. And by the mortification of our senses, by the custody of our eyes, we're that soldier of Christ. And if we let our guard down, we can easily get struck. We can get knocked down. Whether knocked down slightly or knocked down gravely. The idea then of what it means to have that sense of sin. This past week, I've been chaplain for Westmead Hospital. So I go around making the rounds, the different wards, because I see the Catholic list, and I go particularly to those who are in the wards suffering from cancer, or those who are closer to death than others. And yesterday, I saw this lady in one of the wards, just conversing with her, her gasping voice, so very much near death. And just in conversation, oh, what's your name? She gave me her name and told her who I was, and I said I was a very humble, charitable priest. <laughs> she didn't believe it either. So in the course of conversation, so I said, would you like communion? Oh, yes, Father. But then I ask, by way of my own strategy, oh, when was your last confession? And when she said, oh, many years ago, I decided to step on her oxygen line. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay. I'm so charitable. There's one thing worse than being Lebanese, being Sicilian. Okay. I have no enemies, though. They're all dead. May they rest in pieces. So... So anyhow, is that on tape? My gosh. So uh, in the course of the conversation, I said, oh, let's make a spiritual journey here. Let's walk through a good confession. But she said, as many Catholics do, oh, I can go to God for the forgiveness of my sins. And I said, yes, you can. But you don't know if you receive that forgiveness. But through confession, you hear those words of forgiveness. You hear it. And it will build you up, is what I said to her. How about it? And she did. Commandment by commandment. All 11 of the Ten Commandments that she break. <laughs> and afterwards, giving her communion and a sense of peace. And it was rather interesting because when I was first talking to her, she had the television on over her bed. As if she wanted to put the volume up as well as I was talking to her. That wasn't going to help. I have a big mouth. It goes through my big nose. All right. So anyhow, but then after she had received, and it turned, certainly turned off the television for the confession and communion, afterwards, and for the anointing of the sick, I said, do you want the television on again? No. That's OK. She was at peace. And today I saw her again, seeing the same word, seeing somebody else. And she smiled, and she had family around her this time, and I said, would you like communion? And her family members are looking, what? You're having communion? And gave her communion with that peaceful smile on her face. You know, a soldier of Christ can always go to bed at night with a peaceful conscience. But those who follow the world will always have a turmoil. Why is that? It's like God made inside of us the innate desire to seek out the one thing that gives us a source of happiness. And the only source of happiness that we can have is something that will last and last, and last. 
And the things of this world, they do not last. Televisions have a six-year warranty, and then they fizzle out. That's it. And then you curse the person, because who made this lousy television? It doesn't work anymore. I'm not happy anymore. The idea, then, of the material things of this world, it just is not sufficient for giving us that happiness that must be everlasting. We consider something higher, and that is something that reminds us once again, when I have that goal in mind, I am going to fight for it. Just like when you're in a loving relationship, a man in a loving relationship with his wife or girlfriend in a proper relationship, you say to yourself, no one's going to take my girl away. You have that idea, that innate idea of that survival of that relationship. Well, the same applies to God as well, our relationship with God. Something inside of us that helps us to desire the only one thing that can give us everlasting happiness, God himself. That's why St. Augustine, who was not a saint at the beginning of his life for sure, said, our hearts are restless, Lord, until they find their rest in you. So when we consider that, we have boundaries. We consider the idea of what the saints called a rule of life. They wanted a rule of life so they could, so they could continue that spiritual battle on that path, a narrow path. The saints would realize, too, wait a minute, not everybody thinks like I do. I'm in the minority here. Not everybody prays like I do. Not everybody loves God the way I do. I must pray for those people. But the idea is, well, first things first, I will pray for that relationship with God to be stronger day after day. Again, strength after strength. So hence we have these boundaries, what we call the Ten Commandments. They come under criticism in the world in which we live, sad to say. But that is our rule of life that directs us and keeps us strong. We have boundaries in life. When you come up to a red light, you're going to stop. The red light says, I must stop. Well, you're Lebanese, that doesn't matter. <laughs> Forget it, it's just a year-round Christmas decoration for you guys. <laughs> but we say to ourselves, wait a minute, that's a boundary I have to stop. The Ten Commandments give us a beautiful boundary. It is also a definition of the soul. The spiritual life gives us definition. It gives us performance. It encourages us to do what is necessary for the good of our soul. Now, imagine the Apostle St. Andrew, when he was being led to be martyred, he was going to be crucified in the shape of an X, the brother of St. Peter. Peter would be crucified upside down because he did not want to be crucified in the same fashion as our Lord. St. Andrew said the same thing. He was crucified in the shape of an X. And when he came to the cross, he said the following words. O cross, formed by divine providence, before I was born. O cross, sweetened for me by the sweet love of my crucified one, nail me now to thee, that I may give myself to him who, dying upon the cross, has redeemed me. Those are his parting words before he underwent the pains of martyrdom. He embraced the cross. Now, a soldier of Christ in the midst of temptation must do the same. That's why whenever we are tempted, the first physical thing we should do is make the sign of the cross. It is a physical reaction to something that may be a bad reaction as well. Or a bad action by way of temptation, when we make the sign of the cross, you'd be surprised how the demons flee at that point, because that is the symbol of our redemption. And the sign of the cross made with reverence is called a sacramental, meaning it gives us the grace to have sorrow for sin. Again, perhaps we don't think of this, but the power of the sign of the cross. We're baptized using the sign of the cross. So you come into this world as a screaming infant, you're baptized with the sign of the cross. You receive the words of absolution and the sign of the cross. I absolve you from all your sins, and in the name of the Father, the Son, and so forth, and the sign of the cross. So we consider there is the soldier's first weapon, the sign of the cross. But when it comes to temptation, again, turn these stones into bread, the idea of the concupiscence of the flesh, or all these things will I give you if bowing down you worship me, the concupiscence of the eyes, or jump off from the temple, your angels will hold you up, the vice of pride. We see here again 
those type of temptations that can easily cross our path. All these things will I give you if bowing down you worship me. We are surrounded by consumerism. We are surrounded by materialism. It seems like the economy can only succeed the more material things we buy. That's how it works, isn't it? Money makes the world go around, does it not? Back in the 1880s, the London Telegraph ran a contest. They asked, we want a definition of money. Perhaps first prize was a bunch of money, but anyhow, the prize, whatever the prize was, but we want to know what is money. And a 10-year-old schoolboy wrote in and won. He said, money is that thing that can buy us anything but happiness and take us anywhere but heaven. Ten-year-old, what wisdom, especially nowadays, 2019, with everything so easily at our disposal. And if, in terms of disposal, how quickly we throw things away and do not make a distinction between the things we need and the things we want. All these things will I give you. The devil loves that. Materialism, good. I will distract you from the things that are spiritual by throwing everything material at you. Think of that. And again, the concupiscence of the flesh. And we know what the world can throw at us in terms of that. Impurity. The sixth and the ninth commandment. Anything that violates the dignity of the human being that can easily, again, make us fall into disrepair, disrepute, to destroy the image of God upon the soul. I sometimes will tell people, if they've been away a long time for confession, I would say to them, would you leave your child in nappies for three weeks or for 30 years? If it's been that long, would you leave your child in nappies for a long period? No, Father, why not? Oh, their child would stink. What about your soul? Your soul is worse than soil nappies when you're living deliberately in mortal sin day after day. How about that? is what I would say by way of a comparison. I'd be nice about it. I'd only hit him once. So, um, and then, so then we consider pride. The devil loves pride. That was his first fall. I will not serve. Because the angels consider the idea, oh, I'll worship God, but I'm not going to worship the Son of God because he's man. And the angels are higher than man. I refuse to worship the Son of God because he is both God and man. That was led by Lucifer, the highest of the angels, the bearer of light. So then you have Saint Michael, who is like unto God. And the great battle that took place in heaven, we can remind us of the battle that still takes place on earth, our own spiritual battle. When the devil tries to have us say, I will not serve. I will not serve the Ten Commandments. I will not serve the Son of God. I refuse. It's all about me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity. What can I do to make myself happy? What can I do in terms of my own self-satisfaction and forget about others and have the entire world center around me, myself, and I? The devil knows how to work. Even if you just look at that mechanically, it can easily happen to us to think about ourselves rather than others. So something to ponder again in the season of Lent, that vice of pride. And that was taken care of because of the second eve the Blessed Virgin Mary, how the humility of a virgin will devastate the pride of a demon. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done unto me according to thy word. Beautiful words of humility that we can say likewise. Lord, behold your handmaid, behold your servant, I will humble myself before you. It's a beautiful thought, especially in Lent, because when we have that virtue of humility day after day, the demons cannot attack. We would be a fortress in their sight because, again, they want mankind to fall in the same way as our first parents fell. If you partake of this fruit, you will be like unto God, as the serpent said. No wonder snakes are poisonous in Australia. It came from the Garden of Eden. Okay. There's a time zone when we attempt it. We can place ourselves in a time zone. What we can do before the temptation, what we can do during the temptation, and what we do after the temptation. So before the temptation, the struggle must be against those things which lead us to that temptation. So again, particularly when it comes to concupiscence of the flesh, do not fight this vice by confronting it. On the contrary, we run in the opposite direction. If it's a person from whom you must uh, 
take leave, then let that person know that he or she is an occasion of sin, or that you cannot keep company with that individual unless a conversion or goodwill is shown and virtue is practiced. We do not want anybody dragging us down into the mud. So do not let the heat of fire evaporate the waters of life-giving grace, the heat of passion that can easily evaporate the waters of life-giving grace. Two, avoid idleness. As the saying goes, idleness is the devil's workshop. The devil loves a lazy body, a lazy mind, a lazy soul. So we become his when we become imbued in the spirit of idleness or the vice of idleness. Okay? Through idleness, we weaken good thoughts and good deeds. And yet the exact opposite of idleness, the desire or zeal for the good of others, will encourage us to practice virtue. Likewise, obedience to God's will and His commandments. That is another means that we take before temptation. What is our battle plan? So I will avoid idleness. I will avoid the occasions of sin, whether it be a person, place, or thing. Thirdly, obedience to God's will and the commandments. Fourthly, avoid rash judgment. Avoid judging our neighbor rashly, especially in regards to his own sins, because we can learn from the mistakes of others, and also at the same time, treat that individual with compassion, because we want that compassion for us as well. Likewise, at the end, be humble. Do not be complacent and think, oh, well, I overcame this temptation, the devil will leave me alone. No, he will, he will intensify his temptations. He will throw that much the more at us as we make an effort to become holy. So that's what we do before the temptation. What do we do during the temptation? Firstly, we find out if it arises from an inward cause or an outward cause. So when I say an outward cause, for example, a lack of custody of the eyes, or bad conversation, immodesty, anything that will exist externally that will encourage us to vice. Inwardly, what would be an inward cause? Impure thoughts, something like that, or some sort of, again, some, some, some suggestion to the devil that we take on board, inward thoughts. Remedy, how do we counter this, O soldier of Christ? Custody of the eyes, modest attire, fasting, mortification, occupying ourselves with our duties that correspond with our state of life, meditating on our Lord's passion. St. Alphonse says, a mind occupied in the passion of Christ cannot sin. So that's what we do during the temptation. After the temptation, do we rest and say, oh good, that was easy? No. We fight that much the more. After the temptation, we keep our mind away from anything, from any thoughts that might provoke us to fall into that temptation in the future. Likewise, a good remedy, spiritual reading, sacred scripture, the lives of the saints, all these different things that we can do to have in our database, so to speak, so that when bad thoughts come to us, because every sin will start by way of a thought, then it goes to the execution of what we are thinking. We put it into act. So if we can have our thoughts fostered and nurtured with holy things like good reading, then we have that right there as a weapon to counter any temptations that may come in the future. It's a beautiful battle plan. A couple of years ago, I was at a bank putting away the church's collection. I always liked doing that. The church got 80%, I got 20%. No, just kidding. Okay, you didn't hear that. So I'm waiting in a queue, and in front of me at the teller's window was this woman and her young daughter. The daughter was in her mid-teens. And you could tell from the gist of the conversation, because that young teen girl wanted to make sure that everybody in the bank heard what she had to say. You could tell from the gist of the conversation that the mother had put some restrictions on her daughter's account. And you could tell from the loud conversation, the loud volume, that the daughter was getting $20 and she wanted more. Mom, I want more than $20. Ah, no dear, that's what we agreed upon, $20. No, Mom, I want more. So the daughter, raising her voice, maybe to try to gain the support of everybody in the bank, it ain't working, sister, let me tell you. So she was louder. No, Mom, I want more. 
No, dear, we said $20. Mom! No. I know, Mom, I have a drug problem, that's it, that's why you're giving me $20. Nobody knew that until that young lady decided to make a public confession, but everybody in the bank heard her. The din, the silence. Again, I was right there in the front. I'm saying to myself, this is a spiritual battle. Mom, don't give in. Don't give in, Mom. And she didn't give in. She said, no, dear, we said $20, and if you don't want that $20, and before she could finish her sentence, there's that young teenage know-it-all screaming at the top of her lungs some words I cannot repeat. And off she went, storming out of the bank. The silence that was still there. The mother, no doubt embarrassed. And the teller that went, oh, okay, what can you do? You know, and, and then the mother walking away with her head down. But me, my big nose, I had to get into it. <laughs> Don't laugh. And I said to her, you are a wonderful mother. And she looked up. Oh, oh, thank you. And she had a smile on her face. And others said, yes, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, right. The crowd control was with that mother. Because even those who may be non-believers in that bank, they saw something there that was a battle between good and bad. What we would call virtue opposed to vice. And that mother held her ground to make sure for the good of her child she was not going to give in. We have a church like that. Holy Mother of the Church. It's a great title. We don't want her to give in. We have a great love for all the teachings of the church. We should, because those teachings are the source of our salvation. We might hear criticism about it, but we can say to ourselves, I have a great mother. And that mother is the bride of Christ, 2,000 years old. Now, if we ever lived to 2,000 years old, we'd be pretty ugly. But the Catholic Church... That must be more beautiful, even in the midst of the present day and age in which we live. Even when we see the human ministers of the church in their own combat, and many of them falling and causing scandal, it is still the bride of Christ, the immaculate bride of Christ. In fact, the running joke would be the church should have been destroyed hundreds of years ago because of the human ministers in the church, but it still survives. Isn't that beautiful? That beautiful bride that we call the Catholic Church. It will always come under criticism, sometimes rightly so, other times in a very misunderstood way. But we can honestly say, I have a beautiful mother. Thank you and God bless you.